Hi friends, welcome to the cornfield. We're about to go on a epic journey together. Today I'm going to go through the 10 films from the Children of the Corn franchise. Of course, Children of the Corn is based on the Stephen King short story. There's been 10 movies and that includes a remake, but the story was first adapted to a short film called Disciple of the Crows. This was made in 1983, but our story starts with the full length feature Children of the Corn from 1984. A couple of things to look out that you might want to put on your bingo card. And of course, if you'd like to trade this in for a drinking game, I would not blame you. Creepy kids drawings, people having visions for no apparent reason, random cameos from pretty famous people. And of course, the unconnected plot. Somehow, I don't know how this franchise is able to do this, but it has... <laughs> It takes the long way around every single film to try and connect it back up to the original cult. None of these films are really connected at all, which was both a surprise and a great disappointment to me. Uh, you're about to watch me spiral into insanity, so grab your popcorn. It's gonna be fast, it's gonna be a ride, and at the end of each film, I'm gonna give you my ranking, and we're gonna talk about the powers of he who walks behind the rose, because these powers, ever-changing, all-knowing, wow, everyone is so creative. <laughs> let's get started, take a deep breath, let's enter the cornfield. Going by year of release, let's start with the original Children of the Corn from 1984. The film's focus is on two grown adults whose lives are torn apart by little terrors. I'm talking about uncontrollable children, even worse, uncontrollable children acting like religious leaders. Starring Peter Horton and Amanda Hamilton and the infamous John Franklin as Isaac and Courtney Gaines as Malachi, the film opens up to a narration of Job, a young boy living in the small fictional town of Gatlin in Nebraska. Three years ago, a tragic event ripped apart the town when the older kids carried out a massacre killing the adults in town. I guess now is as good time as any to explain he who walks behind the rose. Isaac, the son of a preacher, was indoctrinated by a demonic spirit which controls the cornfields, corrupting the children of the town, speaking to them as a god, convincing the children to sacrifice the adults. This is because as an adult, it's impossible to be pure. Thus, they are all sinners. We learn that Isaac is just his mouthpiece. And of course, as mentioned, before in each movie we go through we're going to talk about the powers that are accumulated by he who walks behind the rose because it's different just like the plot just like everything in each film. The children of Gatlin now live in fear of the new leaders, obeying their strict rules. But Job and Sarah get off lightly because they did not participate in the killings and still haven't accepted the deity in their heart. Oh, and don't forget, Job's sister Sarah is a psychic and draws really creepy yet detailed pictures for no real reason. It's kind of a trademark of this series, which we'll see carry on and eventually disappear. After this intense opening story, we jump to three years later. Also, major goof, it's meant to be three years later, but all of the kids from the opening scene are exactly the same age these three years afterwards. We follow Bert and Vicky as they drive through Nebraska, but when they hit a runaway, the locals try and steer them away from directly driving into Gatlin, but they find the city center and go straight to Job and Sarah's house, where they see, of course, the creepy pictures. Searching and separating like all good horror movie characters, Vicky gets taken for sacrifice. Bert enters is the cornfield where we get our first hint of supernatural elements. From there, it's a cat and mouse game where Bert hides with Job and Sarah whilst Malachi turns the pack on Isaac and they overpower him, revealing he had nothing but fear and his threats to protect him. Then it's sacrifice time. For the ending of the film, everyone meets in the cornfield for a showdown, including he who walks behind the rose. And maybe he should have stayed behind the rose because we get these insane wild effects. Who else thinks that these might have been best left on the storyboard? 
Isaac emerges after being sacrificed and now he's possessed by he who walks behind the rose. The adults escape with some of the children and then they burn down the cornfield to destroy the entity for once and for all. I mean, it's only the first movie, but I'm sure it's the last time. They knock one more child out before leaving her in the car, unconscious, and walking off frame. The interesting thing about this film is once the parents are eliminated, the children fall into their own hierarchy. The film plays on small town religious cliches, but in this version with the children in charge, the beliefs suddenly become dark or maybe darker, opening up a dialogue about who we really trust in power positions of these religious structures. This belief is deeply rooted even their friend who is escaping warns them while disobeying the ruler. If you tell you're gonna burn on the lake of fire for all eternity. Religion follows and rules them no matter how their society is structured. This includes power play within their own structure as we see Malachi and Isaac fight to hold their ranking. It's terrifying to see these children obeying and of course carrying out murders because of their beliefs. It leads you to wonder what makes this scary? Is it the creepy kids? Or is it that they believe something that would kill others? Because that happens every day. I'm not trying to be controversial, but Stephen King was indeed making a example of organized religion, turning the focus to creepy kids, making it more digestible. The film has a uniqueness, playing off creepy kid horror movie syndrome with good measure of religious cults, dropped into an isolated landscape that reflects the wealth of America. The corn industry in the US being worth over 86 billion dollars. Like religion, it's known as a big part of the American values. And of course, I'm not saying that's for everyone, but looking at it from the collective view. The cornfield is the perfect metaphor for this in a mini religious experiment. For now, he who walks behind the rose is just in its burning witch's phase. Give it time. There is no doubt where this one lands on the ranking. It is first. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it's about to get really rough. And of course, he who walks behind the rose, we now know has the power of influence and possession. Imagine being number two in a franchise of 10 and claiming it's the final sacrifice already. Y'all have some nerve. Children of the Corn 2, The Final Sacrifice from 1992 brings an interesting twist to the story. I didn't say good, interesting. Even though it's been eight good years, the story picks up with the news report of them discovering everything that happened in Gatlin. Discovering the abandoned children and plenty of dead bodies. The children are quote unquote saved, checked and put onto a bus to enter foster care. Weaved in with this is the story of a father and son, Garrett and Danny, who are dealing with a relationship breakdown. The father is a city journalist who drags his son into the action, arriving at Gatlin to get their own account of the tragedy. Tragedy. And he who walks behind the rose makes an early appearance, showing that the entity is still alive and strong. But we're already missing some familiar faces. Both Isaac and Malachi are gone, which of course coincides with their fate in the original. But I'm still really surprised they got rid of these two iconic characters so early in the franchise. They are replaced by Mordecai and Micah, the new leaders. Micah appears to be possessed, much like Isaac in the first film. Because although most of the children have been displaced, a small amount still gather to help keep their faith alive. It's an interesting dynamic, all of the religious creepy kids just frozen in time. Especially while we have the cliche of the old town crazy who try to warn everyone, poor Mrs. Burke, but she does have one of the best kills in the whole franchise to her credit. Ding dong. And it's not long before the children take on the rest of the town using voodoo magic. Who would have guessed? Because why not? Micah then tries to recruit Danny by using his rocky relationship with his father. Another look at the method of cults preying on damaged relationships. Meanwhile, with the help of a local Native American, Red Bear, Gavin starts to discover the truth. Red Bear reveals an old story about the land. A long time ago, a tribe lived and farmed on the same land, but the adults became lazy and stopped farming. The children then rebelled and killed their parents. This is also connected to the spirit that will quote, open the corn and let through one who finds truth within himself. Whoever this soul is, they have not been revealed just yet, leading to the possibility that the true leader of he who walks behind the rose has not been revealed. But in a twist, Red Bear and 
and Gavin discover a mold substance growing on the corn. Realizing this is because they've mixed in the old crop with the new crop to avoid losing money, it's revealed that this substance can become airborne and happens, just happens to create hallucinations and insanity in children. Could the entity be in their minds? The film ends with their children trapping adults in a building that they set on fire. They then retreat to the cornfield for a final sacrifice of an adult and a virgin. But help arrives just in time with Red Bear and Gavin who end the ritual. We then get a chase scene revealing the entity moving underground which is so cool. Micah is killed but not before morphing into possibly the true form of he who walks behind the rose. The blended family of survivors drive into the distance. The movie is below average, I'm gonna be real, but it does take time to add examples of how cults bring in their members, keeping vague their true intentions and trying to divide them from their loved ones. We also get to learn about the curse of the land as per Red Bear's stories. This might be just the cycle of life within this cornfield. Wasn't a big fan of this one and sadly I had no idea what was coming next and that even these below average films were at least watchable. And of course, let's add voodoo magic to the board of the powers belonging to he who walks behind the rose. It's the Babe Pig in the City remix. Children of the Corn 3 Urban Harvest is from 1995. The film opens to two children in a cornfield, which believe it or not, is not in Gatlin. They lead their abusive father into the corn for a sacrifice, but older brother Joshua is oblivious to the younger brother Eli using dark magic to conjure up he who walks behind the rose to kill their father. At this point, we know it's the Children of the Corn, but we're not meant to know how it's connected to the town of Gatlin. After this, the two boys are adopted by Amanda and William, a city couple living in Chicago. We see Eli acclimate immediately when he sees the religious folk in the cities protesting for their gods. It feels like home. Eli is a real Damien, if you know what I mean. He makes people hallucinate, moves things with his mind. He is a terror. He even starts his own demonic crop in an abandoned property next door. And the creepy pictures, they're still in it. Eli becomes an artist drawing his premonitions. Joshua does his best to connect with the city kids and for some reason he knows how to play basketball like a pro just like all good farm boys. This leads to a rift between the two brothers. Meanwhile, the demonic crop is in full force and Eli starts using parts of the crop to poison the community. As his reputation for being a bit of a religious psycho grows, it's revealed that Eli and Joshua are not blood brothers. And you guessed it, I'm seeing a theme here. Eli's dad was a preacher. Not only that, but he is adopted from Gatlin. Adoptive mother Amanda realizing Eli's dark side meets her maker in a gory scene when trying to cut down his crop. But it's not long before Eli converts all of the kids at school. Actually, it's very sudden. Now the whole school are basically his disciples. The film ends with William selling the new strain of corn that Eli created to the masses. Eli starts killing off the other students' parents. I loved the split head death. And Joshua returns to Gatlin to kill off the source, which is a Bible. He brings it back just so he can be all dramatic and have a final showdown with his brother Eli. Eli dies, which I'm really sad to say, and the demon known as he walks behind the rose is revealed in the flesh. The kids escape the entity, but meanwhile, the corn is shipped off across America. Urban Harvest is a very different entry, not just because of its location, but the film reflects strong Christian imagery, starting with the priest in the school, he's crucified upside down, which reflects the idea that Eli's God is demonic. I know that this is not what the inverted cross actually means, re Saint Peter, but we're going for the symbolism that it's usually used for. It's edging on the conjuring territory, feeding into black and white, good or bad to religion. Eli's niche god, evil, while organized religion, Godsend, which is a far cry from where we started with the original story and the metaphors there, which was meant to show the flaws within all religion. But what this film does have is insane kills and it's one of the most gory of the whole franchise. It's creative to a new standard and I wouldn't say it's worth that alone, but it's not awful. And Eli is kind of fun. In a chaotic, psychotic, campy way, he's an icon. 
daddy's home. I enjoyed this one more than the last and unfortunately it's downhill from here. But we get to add that he who walks behind the rose is able to give devotees power and full on magic abilities. Oh, thank you corn gods for sending me an angel. I really need it right now. <laughs> The fourth film in the franchise stars Naomi Watts as Grace. In The Children of the Corn 4, The Gathering, we follow Grace as she returns to her small hometown in Grand Island, Nebraska to take care of her mother who is dealing with a severe mental illness, trapping her in her own house, giving her intense nightmares or premonitions. Dun, dun, dun. The horror starts early with a mysterious boy camping out in the barn, trapping, killing, and performing rituals on the adults in the town. These rituals cause all of the children in this town to become suddenly sick with a deathly fever, including Grace's younger siblings who are still living at home. Grace helps out at the local clinic and begins to have visions of her own. The children return home and start showing signs of possession, changing their names and personalities. Their new names match up with children who used to live live in the town, who all passed away from tragic events. What I'm trying to tell you is there's something wrong with the children. My god, has anyone checked the children? And of course these incidents start happening near the local cornfield, but honestly this whole town is screwed. Grace teams up with a local father, Donald, whose wife was murdered by his son. He knows something is wrong and convinces them to explore all avenues. They learn of the story of Josiah, a child preacher who was magnetic to the believers around him. The older preachers used him as a cash grab and tried to keep him young by feeding him mercury, attempting to stunt his growth. This only drove him crazy and when the town learnt the truth, they abandoned him. Josiah took revenge on the adult preachers, killing them, so the townspeople dragged Josiah into the cornfield and burned him alive and then sealed his ashes into a well. This reminds me of something, Naomi Watts. A well? A child stuck inside? In the end, it's revealed that Josiah has taken what they call a like child, a child who was also abandoned and lied to. It turns out that Naomi Watts' sibling, Margaret, is actually her own daughter. She had her when she was young and left her at home with her mum and dad. The call is indeed coming from inside the house. Meanwhile, the children of the town gather in a barn next to the cornfield. Possessed, they begin a blood ritual. Donald and Grace head to the barn and have a showdown with the children, killing Josiah and releasing the children. Something that struck me as a standout for this film is the cinematography. It's very dramatic, the angles, but also the film traded in any backstory for scares, starting them early and forfeiting any character building. There's no real tie-in to Gatlin or the original cult. In a deleted scene, there is a line that explains Josiah is also called he who walks behind the rose. So I'm assuming we have to believe that he's just one of the many cycles of the religious cult within the state. The film is extremely straightforward, evil children bad, and there's only a few fun kills, but overall, it's just bland. They also finally gave up on trying to tie in creepy kid pictures somewhere, but it was still extremely cliche in the creepy kid department. I'm gonna have to put this one here on my ranking because of its blandness, but we did get a very exciting addition to He Who Walks Behind the Rose's power. In this one, technically Josiah was a ghost trapped in a well and he was released and haunting the town. I warned you, it was gonna get wild. It's 1998 and Children of the Corn has gone full slasher. Adopting the current trends of the time, I mean Scream had just come out two years prior and they had to adjust to a different demographic. Children of the Corn 5, Fields of Terror. It's a change from the original adults fearing children. Now it's a teen slasher nightmare, which of course means fun kills. The film follows six college students on a road trip to pay tribute to their late friend, but trouble starts when they take a wrong turn and end up in a small town run by a cult. You know the drill. This film stars Eva Mendez, Alexis Arquette, yes this is Patricia and David Arquette's sibling. Kane Hodder also makes a cameo as a bartender. The film opens to a child, Ezekiel, being possessed by something in the cornfield. Flash to a year later for no reason, the 
kid has immense power and is the new leader of sorts for a cult group of children, killing adults of course. We then follow the group of college kids and it's not even 15 minutes before two are goners. Then the remaining crew, Kerr, Allison, Greg and Tyrus traveling in a different vehicle have an accident and now they're stuck in a rural town. They find the small town's bar and enter and it's explained to them that the strange smell of this town is due to a farm continuously burning. It's run by a man who has adopted a group of children who worship our old pal, he who walks behind the rose. So that's our connection. The four are trapped in this town with the only bus for the day already gone. They return to their car to find it in flames, a warning from the local children. Approaching a vacant house, they plan to camp out for the night. And of course, it's not a teen slasher without some sex and then the dead bodies of your friends showing up. Allison now puts a spanner into the works as she reveals to Greg the story of how her brother Jacob joined a cult and it just so happened to be he who walks behind the road. She'd never been able to find him. So in the morning, she decides to stay in the town and find her brother, who just happens to be turning the ripe age of 18 the next day, which means in this cult, it's time for a sacrifice. She finds him, but he says it's his choice to sacrifice himself and he has a life. He even has a wife and a baby. Yes, I'm aware none of this makes sense. Meanwhile, the children have an effect on Kerr and we see her willingly join the cult and sacrifice herself to the entity in place of Jacob. It turns out Jacob was trying to escape after all. And then it's revealed in a shocking twist that Ezekiel has been possessing the farm owner for years. He was actually dead inside and they were just able to make him talk, using him as a cover for the fact that the farm is run purely by the children cult. How does it end? Well, we get a wild fight scene between the children, cops and the teens. They even pull out a chainsaw and a blowtorch, but they all pretty much die including Jacob, Allison's brother. Allison then final girls her way to the continuous fire, dumping fertilizer on it, killing the god. But not before hooking and throwing Ezekiel into the flames for good measure. The children are free and the film ends with Allison taking Jacob's baby as her own. And then three, two, one, cue the demonic baby eyes. You know what? I'm trying to find the good here and this film probably has the best motive. There's a part in the film where the cult children try to bring in Kerr by preying on her grief from her late friend. They also receive this Bible which holds the cult's beliefs and Kerr reads it and buys into this sentiment that all children are pure until adults teach them otherwise and then they become tainted or evil. Allison has a great line to go with this. I think there's probably a lot of truth in it. That's what makes it so dangerous. It feels like the motive links back to the original intention of Children of the Corn, presenting real life dangers of a religion with an over the top example, making it so much more digestible. The film also shows the examples of how these cults prey on the vulnerable like her. Although the film is nothing special, it is really well paced and continuously pushes forward, unlike a lot of the other films in this series. But this is where it lands in my ranking. And of course we can add to the he who walks behind the rose power ventriloquism because Ezekiel was somehow able to control another human at the same time as himself. Can you believe we just passed the halfway mark? The only thing that can save us now would be a return of John Franklin as Isaac. And let me tell you when this came up in my marathon my hopes were way too high. Our savior cult leader back to rescue the franchise. Are we finally getting back to the roots of the story? Will the connection to the OG Gatlin child cult make any sense? And didn't Isaac die in the first one? How can he return? Well, it's the old coma trick, of course. We start with the most wild narrations, setting up the whole backstory of a character in a lazy, unthoughtful manner. We follow Hannah, who is an adopted teenager who's traveling back to Gatlin to find her biological mother. It's kind of sad, but as generic as this setup is, at least it gives the film direction and connection to a core story. Notes, I think at this point I'm officially broken and I'll latch onto anything, 
any signs of storytelling, storyline, and unfortunately it's all downhill from here. On her way, Hannah picks up a ghost cult member who spooks her. Crashing into the cornfield, she makes quite the impression on the locals. This is the first film of many to utilize the small town regional landscape. This stylization looks very similar to Texas Chainsaw Massacre, a franchise that I have ranked before. I actually had a lot of fun with that one if you want to check it out. Warm colors, intense shadows, it's that hot uncomfortable feeling moving through an unknown town. This version of events could really be seen as a direct sequel to the first. The town is known for its dark history and the town has become infamous online. But the people of Gatlin know who Hannah is immediately and as she heads to the hospital for a quick checkup she sees Isaac who has been in a coma, her arrival waking him. We find out from the locals that Hannah's arrival is part of a prophecy but do they tell her? No. They actually say that she needs to find it out for herself. Why didn't you just tell her? Prophecy says she has to find out for herself. What a great way to explain away any logical moves in this film. Another interesting addition is the colourful characters. Straying away from the religious folk we see in other films, we get our own gothified townie. Love that. In fact, all of the kids here aren't very cultish and although I love self-expression, it's really off-brand and disappointing. Turns out the whole town is full of the children of the children of the corn. It's a generational thing. And the film, I hate saying this, it quickly turns into a soap drama with messy interpersonal relationships and not much horror at all. Hannah is helped by local hottie Gabriel, but it's all leading to one conclusion. Hannah begins to have strong visions and half the town is trying to scare her off while the other half are trying to push her towards the prophecy being fulfilled. Hannah finds her birth mother Rachel who tells her that she gave her away to protect her from quote becoming the mother of a superior race as per Isaac's wishes. Part of the prophecy involves Isaac's son, Matt, who's meant to impregnate her. Yep, I know it's a lot to follow. As I said, soap drama. The film ends with Isaac attempting to carry out his ritual, creating his superior race, but it's interrupted by those in the town trying to stop the prophecy. We finally get a nice blood sacrifice. Gabriel then saves Hannah, and naturally they have sex in the barn. Because you know what? After a good sacrifice, isn't that what everyone's in the mood for? And then of course it's revealed, dun dun dun. Gabriel had his own motives. He is he who walks behind the rose in the flesh and he was the whole time. Hannah and Rachel escape blowing up the hospital with he who walks behind the rose inside. But as Hannah walks away, is she impregnated with evil? I was so sad with the outcome of this film. Somehow they turned it into a drama soap and with the return of the original actor, John Franklin as Isaac, the least they could do was give the town the original cultish vibe. Are you kidding me? Instead, it's a complete mess of new characters and bizarre outcomes. It's sloppy writing that goes nowhere. It lands here in my ranking and adds another great power to the list. Now he who walks behind the rose can impregnate humans with his offspring. Okay, it's time for a facelift as we enter early 2000s horror for Children of the Corn Revelation. Finally, a little grunge stylization, so I thought. But our fate as the audience is sealed by this line. Where are you? This is the magnetic opening. The plot that's meant to draw us in? How is it only getting worse? The CGI red corn field growing during the opening titles is their nail in the coffin. We're only three minutes in. Prepare yourself for possibly the most over-the-top addition to the series. In this seventh installment, the plot follows Jamie, a woman traveling to Omaha, Nebraska to find her grandma, who seems to be trapped inside an apartment building overrun by children emerging from the adjacent cornfield. The film opens with Jamie arriving at her grandma's building. Her grandma has not returned her phone calls in a week. She discovers the apartment is empty and also finds a Bible next to her bed, which is really strange because she has been an atheist apparently her whole life. Jamie attempts to file a missing person report, but surprise, surprise, the cops are no help. It's up to her to wait it out, hoping her grandma will come home. So it's time for 
for a lot of creepy music, dramatic lighting, fog machines, run in with cultish kids, and you know what? Thank God they went all out with this one. I was almost happy to see the cliche blank stares and overpowdered pale faces. The kids are back to dressing in Amish wear and it's peak creepy kid energy. They're doing the absolute most. Pushing people off buildings and they're suddenly able to teleport across rooms. Jamie finally discovers the bizarre crops growing next to the building and also a priest who is lurking in the darkness. Jamie then starts having visions, very cute stylized ones at that. The cop that she originally tried to file the report with then comes back and says that he's done some research. Jamie's grandma was actually part of a cult as a child. This cult sacrificed themselves in a fire, but her grandma survived. Black corn starts showing up all around the building and the kids use these kernels to kill victims by just dropping them near them. Example, this bathtub scene. The whole apartment building is under attack and then the priest who's been lurking in the shadows explains to Jamie that her grandma was never meant to make it out of the fire. Thus, he who walks behind the rose wants her, Jamie, dead too. The film ends with Jamie having a final battle with the children. They had to fit them all in the frame so I guess that's why they added the swing. Jamie burns the corn in the building and then sets the building on fire. The corn then fights back but ultimately she is rescued by the police officer. The souls of the children are released. Cue credits. At least this entry had a little investigation to it that links back to the original concept. It's like the original cult's children of children have respawned to a new branch of the cult. The cliche shades are a lot but it's not too convoluted believe it or not it's pretty simple and honestly Claudette Mink who plays Jamie did her best to save it and we get a cool night vision scene. Overall Revelations tries to give the audience what it wants while delivering zero originality. At times it even feels like a video game. A simple story of cat and mouse dressed up for fun. This is where it lands on my ranking and we've got to add the power of teleportation. Okay, before we get to Genesis, the next sequel, because we're doing this by year of release order, we need to make a pit stop at the first ever attempt at the Children of the Corn remake. This film was written for TV and it's based on the original story. We go all the way back following the original couple Bert and Vicky as they drive across Nebraska. The production cost feels immediately higher than the last few and the film opens up to the children's uprise. Our new Isaac is preaching his little heart out. The theme song for the original plays in the background and honestly this should be causing goosebumps. But the kids themselves, they just don't feel right. They're too normie looking. The leader isn't creepy at all. In fact, he's kind of adorable. Okay, I say that until they slaughter an animal two minutes in. Skip to 12 years later, we follow Vicky and Bert as they road trip across the state. This time, not in a loving relationship, but they're fighting when they hit the runaway, which leads to a further fight and Bert assaulting Vicky. They really don't want us to like these characters, but Bert and Vicky do have some more in-depth discussion about religion. And then Isaac is finally revealed and they cover the plot hole from the first. Now, instead of years later, the kids being the same age, we have a new turnover of kids, a new generation, since all of the older ones have been removed. We see this disturbing proof later with a pregnant child. And this cult is the most organized one so far, wearing possibly the best costume design of the franchise, which is a complete 180 from the opening scene. They're all in this original black and white dress. They look great. Great, but there's something off once again. I can't take Isaac seriously, especially when he's next to this sacrificial corn <laughs> with a face. Malachi is also back and he doesn't have as crucial of a role as he did in the original film. Meanwhile, our couple are still fighting and they're honestly insufferable. I hate them so much in this movie. They explore the abandoned town while trying to find someone that they can tell about the runaway that they hit. They split up, which we love in horror movies, of course, and Vicky is attacked by the cult who surround her car and sacrifice her on the spot. They don't even go to the cornfields. The story deviates completely from the original film. Bert, who can't help but tell us every five minutes that he's in the Marines, starts fighting the children. But the cult has huge numbers and they chase him into the cornfield. And then they sing. Sowing seeds of kindness. Sowing in the noontime and the dewy. 
At this point in my marathon, I was understandably losing it. And this made me feel like I was delusional. After that moment of quirkiness comes to an end, we enter a chase scene in the cornfield, which Bert has visions of his time at war. Flashbacks, seeing his peers shooting between the rows. It's pretty disturbing. And then the film comes to a bizarre ending. The children retreat, going back to their lodging where they feast. And they all watch some of the older children have sex. Bert finds the middle clearing of the cornfield where his wife, Vicky, and other adults have been crucified as sacrifices. And we cut to the morning as Isaac is explaining to the members that they must sacrifice themselves at 18. Something we already knew since there are a lack of adults. And then it's revealed that Bert has been crucified. And then it just ends. I am beyond disappointed with this remake. There's not one likable character or any direction giving. It's a half-baked story. And if we had no prior knowledge about the backstory, it it wouldn't make much sense at all. There's no tension, just scenes strung together. The stylization of the film lays the sepia tones on thick, which makes it feel like a hot and dangerous land. But it wasn't until this moment that I knew they were taking a leaf directly out of Texas Chainsaw Massacre's book with the sound effects. This is also the first film that does not reveal anything about He Who Walks Behind the Rose. And because of Bert's downfall being lost in the cornfield, we're not too sure if there was anything mildly supernatural going on or if he was just losing his mind. It appears that He Who Walks Behind the Rose may not be real at all. I was so disappointed in this one. Here's my ranking. Moving on swiftly, Children of the Corn Genesis is the ninth in the series and the eighth sequel. Again, we are using the term sequel pretty loose because the core story doesn't seem to matter at all to anyone, except for me at this point. The film follows the homecoming of a soldier who enters his family home to find his parents brutally murdered, their eyes gorged with corn. After a title sequence, we cut to a couple sitting in the middle of the road and it looks like a boiling hot day. Instead of showing the car breakdown, we are spared and we're straight to our leads, Tim and Allie, who are a couple waiting for help of any kind. It's hinted early that Allie is pregnant. Allie and Tim are complete opposites to the couple we just discussed in the 2009 remake. They have chemistry and they're caring of each other. I love it. They're actually likable. And later in the film, Tim references David Blaine. And I don't know why, this just really won me over. This house is rigged. I still think she's David fucking Blaine. I guess I'm a cheap date at this point. But back to the start, they find a house nearby and ask the man inside for help. He refuses until Allie mentions she's with child. The man's wife is played by Barbara Nadeljakova from Hostel and she acts strange as they enter the house coming on to Tim while they're alone. Tim uses their phone for help, but no luck, and they're stranded until they get a lift tomorrow. That night, Ali explores the property and finds a church-esque building that she believes has been turned into a sex dungeon. She also hears what she believes to be a child inside. Tim discovers a camera full of ominous images. Both are confronted by the man who owns the property, who explains that he is originally from, you guessed it, Gatlin and he was actually the man at the start of the film. He explains that he missed the tragedy because he was away on duty. He says that the child in the barn is his wife's, who was pregnant before she came to be with him, and because of his Gatlin background, he now knows true evil when he sees it. Oh, and he also has visions. The couple freak out and start trying to escape, but the house turns on them with poltergeist-like action. They retreat for the night where Ali has some really detailed dreams about the cult, and they watch a police these men arrive and look around the property, but he is unable to hear them before being yeeted into the sky. They come out of their rooms and confront the husband and wife of the property again, and the man explains that they are being kept there by a different power, the power of he who walks behind the rose. And it's controlling everyone because it wants Ali's unborn baby. The next day they escape by taking the abandoned police car. At the same time, a delivery driver comes by and drops off a toy which happens to be stacked cars. 
So naturally, Final Destination style, while the kid in the barn is playing with this toy, which just happens to be stacked cars, he takes one off, releasing it, which miles away controls, <laughs> stay with me, an identical looking vehicle that releases a car onto the couple who are driving away. And believe it or not, the ending gets even more bizarre. The crash kills Tim, so Alice, for reasons unknown, is taken back to the spooky property where it's revealed now, well, there's kind of no escape and that was some kind of prophecy. She goes and holds the kid in the barn and it ends. The film had a good setup and likable characters, but once they entered that house, they went round and round between the visions and the man on the property, let's be real, talking a lot of mad shit. When the couple attempt an escape and they drive away, they even say that they don't know what was real and what wasn't. Nothing is clear, but not in a challenging way, in a waste your time and dodge any real plot development way. It also had no cornfield action really at all. It is getting harder and harder to rank these films this one lands here. And of course, poltergeist energy and also controlling objects several miles away, whatever you call that. And we have arrived, the 10th Children of the Corn in this series. Children of the Corn Runaway follows Ruth. Get this, a runaway from the Gatlin cult. We start with the title sequence explaining the backstory of Ruth, a member of the Corn cult who is pregnant and she feels betrayed that they sacrificed everyone she loves. So she burned the field and fled with her unborn child. Cut two years later, she's living with her son, Aaron. They live on the road as scavengers selling what they can. Can. They struggle and one night they're given shelter by a mechanic. Ruth then works on the cars and shows the mechanic that she is worthy of a job. And in waltzes a creepy girl. And this is where Ruth's visions start. All of a sudden they realize they're surrounded in this town by strange locals and creepy kids. But they find a friend in a local waitress. Her name's Sarah. Ruth gets the opportunity to move into a house and her visions become overwhelming. There's also this weird tension between Ruth and the mechanic who hired her. At one point they start to get it on, but then they yell at each other for that scene, a scene after. They just have a really weird relationship. And thank God the mechanic is finally killed by the creepy girl. And Ruth then becomes convinced that the creepy kids in this village will do the same to the whole town as they did back in Gatlin. The 10th film ends with Ruth following the creepy girl to her house and finding that she has killed her whole family. And then... Get ready for it. Take a deep breath, sit down. The plot twist is Sarah shows up and we realize that Sarah was part of the cult luring her and her son back in. Ruth has also become part possessed and has carried out these killings we've seen in the town without her knowing. Her son Aaron then kills her and cut to sometime later, he is now a preacher. Gatlin got the son they always knew was theirs. This film, surprise, surprise, feels completely unconnected from the other films. The story relies on visions that feel completely random and it also takes place in a completely different town. The drone shots also took me out every time. It's ungraded and it just does not suit the rest of the footage. And one thing I particularly disliked about this film is that he who walks behind the rose has no representation. I feel like a broken record, but this film has no real direction, it splits off every which way, and the plot twist or payoff, whatever you want to call it, it just feels forced. None of it really makes sense. Here is where this lands on my ranking. And I'm so sad to say, shaking fist at Cloud, because of this, this does not have a final report of he who walks behind the rose. With all of the information we're gathered on this journey, we can see he who walks behind the rose literally has no rules, no law, no rhyme, and no reason. It's everything everywhere. Overall, this franchise was really surprising to me. I remembered loving it, the first three films, and honestly, the first one and three, they're all right. Number three is fun in a campy way. Um, and that's really not how I saw this going. I'm gonna be completely real. I did not realize what I was getting into. What started as a really interesting look and breaking down religious cults turned into a nonsensical journey quite fast and tried to move with the times throughout the decades. What's really interesting about Children of the Corn is it's moved from the 80s all the way through to today. So we've been able to see it in all different stylizations of horror, but I don't think that this was reflected 
really that well at all. In saying all of that, I am surprisingly excited to see the new remake and I will be reviewing that. And because now, like me, you know everything there is to know about Children of the Corn, we can reflect and see where this fits in, if it does, in the whole franchise and if they're going to turn things around. I'm, I have hope. I don't know why, but I have hope. I really want to love Children of the Corn. I love cults. I love corn. And it's just occurring to me now that this franchise probably had the desired effect on me and made me delusional and indoctrinated me into part of its cult, now wanting to accept the leader, wanting to think that there is any kind of meaning to the madness. And sometimes that's what unfortunately these cult religions are about. Making sense of it all. I'm gonna leave you here. If you did enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and share it around. It took me way longer than I'd like to admit. And I really put myself through the ringer and sanity is at an all time low. Let me know what your favorite Children of the Corn is down below. I'm dying to know. Or let me know how far you got in the series and I'll talk to you all very soon. Stay safe, stay sane and stay out of those cornfields. Bye friends.